Good morning, uh, everybody. I think, you know, we have an international speaker, so I think I would like to go ahead and get started. And this is the, the fourth annual pastoral care celebration. And uh, this time it would be a very special uh, one because of the COVID-19. Essentially, I think, you know, to go back on this uh, special significant uh, celebration for this um, uh, fourth annual thing. Um, COVID-19 has been very devastating. Uh, we have, uh, as an infectious disease doctor, uh, I was uh, in the front line along with several others and uh, um, not only being a practitioner, but I also lost uh, uh, classmates uh, like uh, Adil Mayuddin and Ishwar Prasad and names, a few of them. And also that uh, we have had uh, deaths among the a lot of uh, Canon Hospice families and Canon Hospice and the Kula Foundation are the co-hosts for this event. And uh, one person that I want to start with is uh, Carla Brown. And uh, her husband you know, died of uh, COVID. And she wanted to make sure his life uh, would not go in vain. And then she started uh, this uh, massive vaccination rollout. And uh, this was uh, supposed to be like, you know, a hundred uh, thousand and, you know, very soon it's gone way beyond 8,000 and it's got uh, recognition all the way from the mayor of uh, Baton Rouge to governor of Louisiana, the vice president Kamala Harris. And uh, she went to the White House and her story has been a any nomination, any nomination, uh, a documentary uh, movie that was presented uh, last year at the Cleveland Film Festival. So, without further ado, that I would like uh, Carla Brown to start uh, her story and uh, prayers to begin this fourth annual pastoral care celebration. Good morning to everyone. God blessings. And it's such an awesome celebration today. But mostly giving uh, thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ who have brought us all here together for one common thread. And that is we care about others. Um, working with and alongside Dr. Akula and the whole Cannon family. All areas of Cannon family, we came together and launched a campaign uh, in region two, three, and nine to inoculate those who are most vulnerable during that time for the uh, with the COVID pandemic. We were successful in our campaign. Our target was 2,000. We were able to inoculate 8,400 and 35 elderly disabled people. And I give thanks because Canon is not just about celebrating uh, closure. We celebrate life. And I want to have everyone to understand we were the first hospice company that inoculated our patients, our residents, with the COVID vaccine. Then other hospice uh, recipients heard what we were doing. We went out and started inoculating other hospice company uh, patients as well. So we celebrate life. And I'm very thankful for having the opportunity to work with Dr. Kula. Like I said, all of our campuses was 100% participation. And with that, I would like to just uh, have this prayer of thanksgiving. So, Father, as we come to you right now, first giving thanks for you raising up a leader, Dr. Akula and the Akula Foundation. Thank you for raising up a mission that is willing to help to serve those most in need. 
Father, I thank you for every person participating in this campaign, pastoral care, because we know, Father, you need voices, you need hands, you need eyes in this season time to spread love and unity where there's so much hate and division. One common thread brings us all together, and that is love. Your love is unconditional. And Father, I thank you for being part of an awesome team. I give you praise for everything, every facet that you allow us to do. Giving you all the praise, glory, and honor. In the name of the Lord Jesus to Christ. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, Carla. All right, then we're going to go ahead and then move down to Dr. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Kuldeep Singh Saluja. And he is you now from Sikandrabad, Hyderabad. And he is the chairperson of the I Hospital. And uh, he is uh, he's from the, he follows the Sikh Dharma and he would like to. Talk about his faith as well as his deeper divine self in this care of the community that he serves. I ask. Go ahead. Good. Good morning, everybody. I'm from Hyderabad, and as you know, the we are known as Sikhs. Sikh means a student. As a student, we learn more from. Guru Granth Sahib, that is our God, like a Bible. So, uh, I've been in this. We we run a medical center known as Gurdwara, that's Sek, Gurdwara Sekhanabad Medical Center, where we have all type of doctors. They come on appointments, heart specialist, dental. ENT. I mean, all type of the doctors are there: physiotherapy, dentist, and all that. And along with that, we have a dialysis center. We we have 15 beds dialysis center with us, which runs for almost 12 hours a day. You know, it is about three shifts in a day we do it, and our charges to the dialysis center. Is only three hundred rupees. Uh, you must, as you all are doctors, you must be knowing the charges for dialysis goes in thousands. And here we charge only three hundred rupees, and we do the dialysis. And our pathology, physiotherapy, all that is very very reasonably planned. And if we have some patients who cannot afford to pay anything, we do it entirely free. So this is our Gurdwara project. And again, Gurdwara another Gurdwara project is free feeding for the poor. Every day, in material, we have a sponsor or we don't have a sponsor. We give lunch to about 300 people every day. In our Gurdwara premises, anybody can walk in, have lunch, and it, it's it's not a limited food. It's as much as they want. They can have it. Uh, some places they give a limited place and then they don't refill. But we don't don't do that. We give them whatever they need. But we get lot of sponsors. But if even if there are no sponsors, we do it ourselves. Then we we give uh, fees for the poor students. They are kindergarten students, school students, or degree college students. We we give give the those who cannot afford. They approach us. We have our own team, and we are doing that service by paying the fees directly to the colleges or schools. We don't hand over it to the P 
people who come for the fees we give it to the school and get the receipts and our, in our community there are some very poor people in and around telangana and andhra uh, they they are known as sigri sikhs that means they do only work with the iron they make utensils of the iron and other things and suppose they have any medical facility they need to the tune of even 10 lakhs 15 lakhs or less we we see that we treat them in best of the hospitals and do the needful if if necessary we even approach the government for the uh, some donations for them so this is all service we do it a, as a sick community and as a lion we run a lions eye hospital which is very very nominal cost who can afford to pay and free for the people who cannot a- along with that we have physiotherapy we have retina department and uh, our and we do a lot of service in that line zone thank you thank you for the service that you do uh, over in that community i actually wanted to recognize at this present time uh, our four chaplains that uh, we have at canon hospice and i must start with uh, pastor bob she's over here and she along with the whole team is at the inpatient hospice uh, in covington louisiana and uh, they are doing amazing service and evidently they have uh, invited all the pastoral care uh, people around along with the staff to uh, to help with this inpatient uh, canon hospice so thank you as bob and and the team and then you have brother dale you know in canon hospice baton rouge she's on as well and i want to recognize him and uh, he's got a passionate praise that he does and i also would recognize uh, <clears throat> reverend all in the canon hospice south shore and he's perhaps been the, the longest chaplain with canon hospice uh, and then uh, lastly we have chaplain uh, craig uh, i don't know if he's here but he's also chaplain you know, from the mississippi and uh, i wanted to recognize uh, their uh, hard work and uh, what they do uh, you know for canon and to the community and uh, this um, event is also co-hosted by the Akula Foundation that is started in uh, 1994 with a vision of uh, serving the community and uh, they have the the largest uh, continuing education program uh, right now and uh, in the state of Louisiana for the social work so we also give a continuing education to the all other uh, nurses and other people and uh, essentially i just wanted to update with you that uh, that there is a tremendous opportunity you know to so and we have a, a grief support group on a zoom which is available for uh, adult children and, uh, and also covid group and uh, these are zoom groups so they actually uh, are available all over the united states as well as the world if someone wants it so this is something that i want you all to be aware and uh, be able to uh, use that and uh, and then we have several other speakers i've seen in you know, dr jain has come joined us dr kamal jain would you please uh, unmute yourself and then go ahead and talk about Hello. your faith and your your interest in the organ donation Hello. Dr. Kamal Jain, uh, near Mumbai, India. Good morning, and Jai Jirendra. Thanks to Akula Foundation for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this program. Friends, you don't have to be a god or superhero to save a life. Just donate an organ, and you can save lives. 
one organ donor can save eight lives and enhance over 75 more all religions including jainism support organ donation jainism is one of the world's oldest religion we jains believe that selfless service or seva to mankind or any living creature is an essential part of spiritual growth organ donation is a form of seva to mankind now what is organ donation organ donation is when a person allows an or- organ of their to be removed legally either by the consent while the donor is alive or after death with the consent of next of kin kidney heart liver pancreas intestines lungs bones bone marrow skin cornea are some of the commonly donated organs human body is beautifully human body is a beautiful creation of god every where every organ plays its role we are a, we are in a state of good health till all these vital organs function properly problem arises when one of these organs becomes sick either by an injury or by a disease and their functions get hampered doctors or medicines can help only for some time and the time comes when sick organ is to be replaced or to is to be replaced to avert what is called an imminent death then from where can we get organs for these sick, pa- sick patients organ cannot be manufactured body rejects animal organs organs can only be procured by human donation in india every year 3 lakh people need organ transplant but only 6 to 7000 of you can say around 2.5 people reportedly manage to get or receive organs there is a huge shortage around 30 individuals die daily waiting for organ transplant these lives can be saved by donating organs that is by giving a dan of your body part dan is a original word in sanskrit for donation meaning selfless giving charity the motto of our 24th jain tithankar lord mahavir is live and let live which encapsulates the main principle of jainism in jainism there are 32 shastra of which dan is one of the very important shastra again there are various kind of dan in which abhay dan that is saving a living creature from the dead is considered as one of the best dan in jainism by giving dan one accumulates a lot of punya that is happiness and that is why dan is considered as one among many sources of happiness in jainism jain scriptures explain that after death the soul departs and the body is of no use to anyone and therefore donating organs of your body to other will mean doing a great deed on your part the jain faith is centered around the belief ahimsa which translates into non violent compassionate attitude to all life compassion is defined as the feeling that arises when you are confronted with another's sufferings and feel motivated to relieve that suffering by donating organs we not only relieve patient's suffering but it is also considered to be beneficial to patient's family which depends on him for their livelihood it is said happiness doesn't really result from what we get but from what we give and we jains strongly believe in this it is reported that in mumbai around 85% of eyes and 95% of skins are donated by our gujarati jains there was an article in a mumbai mirror newspaper which found that jains are self motivated when it comes to donations and helping someone most of the time when asked to the families of jain communities whether they are willing to donate organs of their dikis they always had a positive response in jan 2016 a family of 7 year old boy dhyan udani from jain community 
agreed to donate his heart and other organs making him the youngest donor in a state such was the reaction to the udani family's donation that the community organized a gathering where more than 500 jains placed their organs as far as organ donation is concerned jain beliefs are very clear that the body from which the soul has departed is of no value thus if any part of that body can be useful and can be usefully employed it will of course benefit someone in the end i would like to say no caste no bars save lives donate organs recycle life thank you Thank you, Dr. Kamal Jain. And Mary Beth is waiting. Mary Beth is going to talk briefly about the Buddha and the suffering. Mary Beth, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Akula. It's a great honor to be on your show here, and I'm delighted to talk about Buddhism because when we talk about health, it is really mental health that we're talking about here. In fact. Buddhism is in the west psychology if we really want to understand Buddhism we revert to a study of psychology and a perfect example is the first thing that Gautama Buddha taught when he became enlightened which was the four noble truths which is one that life is suffering second noble truth there's a cause of suffering the third noble truth there's an end of suffering and the fourth noble truth is the path the eightfold path And what they mean by life is suffering a lot of people misunderstand this it is not a pessimistic um way of life it is that if one is not peaceful and joyful 24/7 every day of one's life one is suffering the buddha say and the second noble truth is there's a cause of suffering and it's always us it's always our thinking that causes suffering nothing in the outside world The third noble truth is an end to suffering is to understand ourselves better the processes of our psychology for example we often blame the outside world or somebody else for our problems and the truth of the matter is if we introspect we understand that it's our triggers and our interpretation of what happened that makes us suffer it's never about what the other person does some but he can say something awful and it'll bother one person and not another depending on their psychology maybe their childhood upbringing and so forth and the end of suffering then is to understand that and then to take steps to do something about it and that's where the eightfold path comes in right understanding right livelihood right speech right action right aim all those things that we learn to understand and to do properly and then we don't suffer anymore So uh Buddhism is definitely a psychology to the west because if we follow the Buddhist path and we do what's right and we say what's right and so forth and we understand it's always our stuff and never what someone else does or says that causes us suffering then we can get free we're not dependent on the outside world at all anything can be going on and happening that's not to deny that there's some things in the outside world that we need to uh, help and change uh, so there's no more war no more hunger crime etc but that's a whole another ball game at least we don't suffer about it and we can do a whole lot more to save the world and help people if we aren't suffering because if we are suffering we don't have much to give to other people so in buddhism it's all about the four noble truths life is suffering if at any time we're not at ease there's a cause of suffering it's always our thinking the end of suffering is to change our thinking and the eightfold path is ways tools to change that thinking so that we are free of ever having to be affected adversely by the outside world and in a nutshell that's good mental health and thank you so much for allowing me to share that with you all today dr azuka thank you mary beth and uh, mary beth is a a country day school teacher and here in new orleans louisiana and uh, she's also 
minister at the you know, Unity Church here in Wales as well. That uh, she has been very inspirational in trying to go beyond, uh, you know, like a one thought of mind, and that is to explore and uh, especially the what's more important is to understand the uh, the suffering and uh, what is uh, done to relieve the suffering. So thank you, Mary Beth. Dr. Madiha Saeed and uh, Dr. Saeed is actually a holistic mom practicing family medicine from Naperville, Illinois. Uh, Dr. Saeed. Thank you so much for everybody for joining me today. Happy Tuesday. Um, uh, thank you so much for this honor because this is something that I'm truly, truly passionate about. And as you can tell, I'm wearing the headscarf. I am a Muslim. So it's, I follow the religion Islam, which really comes uh, from the root of meaning peace. So a Muslim is one that finds peace through submissions to God's commands. So we believe in, um, you know, the angels, all the prophets, all the scriptures that have been sent to all the prophets, belief in the afterlife. You know, uh, Muslims believe in God's, uh, God's divine will and decree and but most of all we uh we follow the five pillars so and when i myself i i am a family physician everybody everybody in my family is a doctor most people and i got sick and when i got sick um i got lupus and hashimoto's and severe digestive issues and that's when i realized that conventional medicine had like hope, but there had to be something more. And that's when um, I started really, really, I prayed to God, God, because please guide me in something that I can help because there must be hope here. Um, and for us, you know, God tells us that, you know, don't lose hope. So here I used my religion to really continue to look for answers and I found Islam is a holistic religion. Islam is about caring and caring for others, um, taking care of the planet, taking care of our bodies, um, where, you know, we need, and with so much suffering in the world, in Islam, we've been told that if you save one man, one person, it's like you saved all of humanity. And when you hurt one person, it's like you have hurt all of humanity. So me being sick and then seeing the tragedy around the world with chronic disease that is on the rise, not even just affecting us, but it's affecting our children. As currently 80%, you know, if we say continue at the current trajectory, 80% of our children will have some sort of diagnosed chronic health condition. And that is not what, especially with autism rates on a rise. So... This is where I saw the world suffering. I saw what we were doing and I saw that I was suffering. And as a Muslim, we're supposed to be people of Alhamdulillah, which basically is praise to Allah, filled with gratitude, filled with hope. And the first word that was sent down to us was Iqra, read. And so that's what I did. I educated myself because there must be a reason like with chronic disease on the rise and not even us and our children, there must be hope. How can I find that? By reading, educating myself. And using that um, to really how I start to educate myself. And when I started doing that, getting to the root of my chronic health condition, trying to look for uh, a, a, an like trying to improve my symptoms because we have been told in our we follow to the Quran and the Sunnah. The Sunnah is what the Prophet used to do. Is God never really inflicts. A, condi uh, a disease unless he's made the cure for it. So for that, I continue to look for answers. I found holistic medicine because uh, Islam is a holistic religion because God in the Quran has told us how to eat, how to live and how to breathe really. And so just by getting back to the source, um, getting back to the way we should be eating real food, not junk food, no artificial fake foods, uh, decreasing our stress, uh, being grateful, uh, sleeping, giving our body the stress, the, the right that it needs for with sleep. And so by just by putting our bodies back into balance the way that God intended us to, I no longer deal with any of the chronic health conditions that took my life. 
and I have been practicing integrative holistic functional medicine for the last 15 years um, with 100% success in improving chronic illness with lifestyle. I'm sorry, my babysitter was an actor. But um, so just by <laughs> just by uh, following the Quran and the Sunnah, and I no longer deal with any of these chronic health conditions. And also, um, I even I've been writing books. So the Quranic prescription, unlocking the secrets to optimal health. This is actually my eighth book. The other ones were for the general audience to really help educate humanity that if we truly lived according to the way that we were supposed to, like eating the way that we should, uh, eating real foods, stress managing, taking care of each other, being grateful for the things that we have all around us that we can lower chronic inflammation and improve not just one of the symptoms that we're dealing with, but then all of them simultaneously. And it really gets back to focusing on what all of the religions have in common. You know, gratitude, peace, fasting, you know, eating real food, love. So just getting back to that really does create, um, you know, healing within us and the world around us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Saeed and uh, Dr. Wilson. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm Dr. Bruce Wilson. Um, I guess spiritually I fall in line with the Self-Realization Fellowship, um, where my guru, Dave, is Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, founded in 1920, it is the word of Paramahansa and how to actualize and self-realize and uh, commune with God. Um, along the path, I have learned how to use that energy in order to, in order to bring myself to a different love and understanding of health and how to benefit, how to benefit my patients. So I do a lot of teaching with, um, just like Dr. Saeed, of holistic health and a holistic um, lifestyle, um, using um, a whole food and plant-based diet to help um, relieve chronic illnesses. I use a lot of, um, I do a lot of guiding and meditation, um, sound and energy healing um, as well. So I do that outside of my medicine practice in the hospital. Um, I found that along the way when answering the questions that I have, um, both spiritually and I guess in the world that we live in, um, I've been able to give that information and impart that information upon my patients and found that they've been having much better success and relief of their chronic conditions. So I find that by opening my spirituality and finding myself and actualizing myself, that I'm then able to impart that information in such a way that that we really see how well the body heals itself and how, how incredible God really is in the way that he's designed us. Um, and so I do a lot of fasting. I teach a lot of fasting online, not just intermittent, but prolonged fasts. Um, I teach uh, and I really teach um, meditation and, and understanding how to use the creative principle that exists within us to bring about overall health, um, both, I mean, really in all aspects of life, because once you start reaching for the, the highest principle, right, once you start reaching for God, then he provides everything else that's necessary. So I teach that as well. Um, <clears throat> so if you are businesses anywhere around the world um, need someone to help guide meditation and understanding truthfully how powerful we are in the creation of honestly whichever desire it is that we seek to fulfill i am very motivational in, in achieving that um, and helping get to the conscious to a certain level where we can access the um the higher aspects of our consciousness thank you dr wilson and uh we got another doctor, a nephrologist. No, her name is Dr. Usha Perry. Dr. Perry is a nephrologist from Dallas, Texas. And thank you, uh, Dr. Akula, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, like you said, yes, I am a nephrologist and an internist, uh, practicing in the Dallas uh, Metroplex for the last 23 years. And I, I am very honored to be on this platform of uh, Pastoral Week and talking about something that is very, very close to my heart and to all of us, as a matter of fact. Um, so for those of you who are wondering how a nephrologist got interested in this, 
I take care of a lot of very sick patients, chronically ill patients. And in my 23 years of practice, I realized that on the one hand, I am trying to prevent a patient with chronic kidney disease from getting on dialysis. But when it becomes inevitable, I help transition them into dialysis in a healthy mindset. And when my patients on dialysis, uh, unfortunately, uh, their time on dialysis does come to an end for a variety of different reasons. And when they're making that transition uh, on to the, to the next area, at that time as well, I realized that being aggressive um, medically is not what they're looking for, but they're looking for some sort of a closure and help with passing on. And in that respect, you know, when I started observing uh, and talking with patients, that's when I realized that these values that are so important when you're passing on are equally important while we're living. And what are those values? Uh, they're really human values. Uh, I just heard uh, Dr. Wilson mention the, the spirituality, opening up our spirituality and the higher principle of divinity. And truthfully, uh, those are as important. And if we live them, through our life, I think it makes it so much easier when we are passing on. Um, so from that perspective, um, actually, you know, it's very interesting that around 20, 23 years ago as well, my journey in exploring the deeper meaning of life uh, through the yogic principles, the principles from yoga, uh, not just the physical posture, but breath work and meditation as well, took off. And what I realized is these principles help me stay connected with those human values of joy, enthusiasm, compassion, empathy, and fulfillment, contentment. Um, so I not only practice pranayam or the, the breath work and meditation for my own personal uh, gain and benefit, but I started teaching this in a pay forward way in a, in a very voluntary uh, fashion through the Art of Living Foundation. Uh, to many, many healthcare professionals during the pandemic as a burnout tool, uh, but also to some of my patients who are interested in learning it just at bedside to take a deep breath. And I know that breath work is now gaining a lot of uh, prominence. Um, it, in the, it was well known to the Eastern Oriental philosophers for many, many thousands of years as a way to control our mind. Um, Actually, control is not the best way to manage our mind, to manage our emotions, to let go of these very difficult, um, heavy emotions of uh, anxiety, anger, frustration, uh, sorrow, with which some of our patients who are passing on deal with, as well as the family's guilt. You know, there's all of these very difficult emotions that they have to handle. To some degree, cognitive coaching helps, but to a large degree, the physiologic tool of breath allows us to let go. And our oriental um, seers and ancient seers have known this for many years and ages. And now uh, we in the West are catching on, just like the posture of yoga caught on here 40 years ago. Now the breath work and the meditation piece of it are catching on as well. Because truthfully, the breath helps slow that mind down and manage our emotions, at which point we can sink into meditation, which is nothing but a lot of people think of meditation as um, a focus, but it's really more of an effortless uh, transcendence of the different layers of who we are. We are not just our body. We are our, our thoughts, our emotions, our intellect, our memory, our ego, that sense of self, who we are. And when we transcend all of that, we connect with our core of who we are, the self. And that is not that much different than the universal energy that's all around us. And when we learn a technique that can help us transcend all those layers, then actually it allows us to harmonize all those layers as well. So it doesn't feel like we're conflicted before these layers, which creates the stress within us. So I found breath as a physiologic tool that allows us to let go of these difficult emotions allow us to come back to our center, to our core. And that allows us to live our human values that we are. We are joy. We are peace. We are enthusiasm. We are innovation, creativity. They're all within us. It's just a matter of breathing out our stress and reconnecting with ourselves. And when I am able to do that, 
I'm such a better, such a better doctor that I'm able to listen to my patients. That deep, active listening comes effortlessly to me, and that allows me to address their concerns in the moment, being very present, and that makes me such a, a valuable doctor to them. And so many patients, as a as a matter of fact, recently last week, one of my patients of 20 years passed away, and she. Went all across the metroplex for care because she was living far away, but towards the end of her life, she found me and came back to where I practice. So her last breath, she did it in on my on my turf, and it was so hard to say goodbye. But I took the time. I sat by her bedside. I said, "I know you never wanted to be on dialysis, and I know you did a very, you know, valiant fight, and I appreciate you for that. It's an honor to take care of you." Thank you for giving me this um, this pleasure, and it, there was such closure both for her and for me. And I truly value all this work that you, all of you guys, do in the, in the pastoral chaplaincy field in giving our patients that closure. So, on that note, um, I will stop and and take any questions if there are any. But I really value this um, evening job that I do of te- teaching people breath work and meditation so i say i i do the whole spectrum of self care primary care secondary care and ter- well i don't do much tertiary care i'm in a small community hospital but i do the whole care self care primary secondary and i take great pride in what i do thank you dr usha kari i think you know we're getting closer you know to our completion of our thing and uh, i want to transition to a inpatient uh, service that we have in the Covington Louisiana and there is a group of uh, people there and i think you know Amy is over there and i think i'm going to unmute Kanosha can you can you have Amy you know say some uh, last uh, prayers and, and then we'll go to Kate Becker to you know end with some beautiful music hello everyone i'm Amy Cryer i'm the chaplain with Canon um hospice I've been here for a couple of months and I work with Pastor Barb and Pastor Earl. And I'm here today with a few colleagues. We have um Jamie Akula here with us today. We have Michelle and we have Susan, Sydney, and McKenna. We're here on the um on the Zoom and we're thankful to be here today. I'm a little congested. Um, but I'm happy to be here. We work in a 15 bed unit, um, inpatient. Um, it is, we help, um, a lot of residents that's on, um, the, at the, at their end of the life stage. And we hear, I'm here as a spiritual support team and to help assist everyone that's here. I believe that, um, we can't function without having some type of spiritual support. part in our life especially at the end stage of our lives. I believe in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe that he's our helper. Um I believe as a chaplain doesn't matter what religion you are, we still need some type of faith base to help us get through our illness. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer. And a quick prayer um and i believe like i said in the spiritual part of my, our life i believe that the lord can help us through every ordeal no matter whether we going through any type of stress in our lives um <laughs> whether um whether um no matter what any type of illness what is mental or uh, emotional i believe that we need that spiritual foundation to help us through everything and i believe that it produces healing yes. and like some of us said it's about the mind change how we function in lives and how we believe and how we believe who we are and what we can be so i'm just going to say a quick prayer lord jesus we thank you for everyone that's on the line we thank you for everyone that's in this room with us today we ask that you bless us and guide us and watch over us We ask that you strengthen us and help us to continue to do the work that you call us to do. No matter what we are doing, we ask that we do it with all our might. We ask that you help us to do it with all our mind and spirit to help those that are in need, to help those that are hurting, to help those that are weak. I know you brought us here to help all those that are here that needs it. So we thank you for the ability to do so in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you and uh, 
we come to the grand finale and that is uh, Kate Beckford. And Kate has been, I have known Kate for quite some time and she's a sort of a mentor in trying to find a balance in my mind and body and uh, has got a fantastic uh, music which is uh, devotional and healing. So I would end uh, this great uh, successful fourth year of pastoral care celebration with all the national international participants with a, a peace and a, and a prosperity and a lot of joy and Kate we take it from here thank you Shiva and thank you everyone thank you this is a celebration after all of your support towards humanity your efforts your skills your presence, your compassion, and your vulnerability as well as your competencies that you too can surrender to the energy of life that moves through all of our bodies on our breath. At the very heart of, the very source of, the very mystical illuminated aspect of every single being is our breath. It means we have been born, that we are alive on this planet. It means that we have died. And all of us in our intimacy with our breathing are sharing the faith, the molecular atoms of our atmosphere that have been around since the beginning of time are the same. There is none that are new, none that are created and none that are destroyed. When we are inhaling and our expansiveness and our consciousness can accept and receive the fullness of our breath, we are engaging in every life, every life. So this is a thank you and our way of celebrating. And we start with the energy of stillness. Even though there are some words, the energy of stillness can still be felt. this energy of stillness where all things are together as one. So in this moment of breathing together, not just a mental activity or a physical activity, but please, the invitation is to resource your heart in this collective prayer of our breath feeling each of us present, devoting ourselves as fully as we can to rising the quality of life on our planet. We cannot do this alone. Take your breath in, receive it intimately and fully. Your breath will find the part of you that needs the most care right now. Soft and smooth until the time has come to let the breath go. Returning for your inhale brand new, receive again the gift of life moving through your body. Release again all efforts to control or judge others or yourself. Feel your heart and mind opening to the wholeness, welling up. Advocate for thriving. We must breathe.
when we hold our breath and contract in our holding patterns, we suffer from the world. Unafraid to be still in our collective heartbeat. Release the weight of your body back down to the earth as fully as you can. Open. to the wealth of all of our histories. It is our nature to heal. May you be buoyed, inspired, and touched by the intimate life force moving in your body. Letting go of what's ready to die. Let it fall. And welcoming the sweet petals of new growth. If the only prayer that we ever speak in this life is thank you, it will be enough. So thank you. Thank you, Kate, you know, for uh, closing with a few remarks. And uh, obviously, I think, you know, Kate has got a, a breathwork uh, session that goes on uh, every day and maybe once every month uh, on a special note. And she has a very uh, divine uh, music uh, that goes with the breathwork. So it is uh, very inspirational. So I really want to thank uh, each of you guys uh, for participating and all over the country and all over the world, and especially you know, from, uh, from Mumbai, Sikandrabad, Hyderabad. Boy, it's like a, I'm, uh, like a little kid you now going back home. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a uh, karma bhumi for me in America. So, and I'm so thankful for everything that uh, everybody has given, and uh, and it feels like that I've got uh, lots to give, and i would always. Uh, cherish the happiness and joy in giving and giving the love and giving everything that I got and obviously of course the as Dr. Jane said I think you know the prized possession when you die is the organ so I think I've already got earmarked you know for it to be useful for somebody's uh, vision somebody's to get off the donate uh, dialysis and all those good things so I want to recognize uh, couple of people who have helped me in it technically. I know it's a, it's a large group from a large participant from all over that uh, one of them is a Shashi and Shashi has been coordinating as a as a co-host and he's been trying to behind the scene 
you know, you don't even see his uh, name and face and all this stuff, but he's working behind the screen. And we also have uh, Lisa singing. Lisa is the one that has actually done a lot of videos in the past. And I think, you know, Kate, you got the video. The, the, uh, Lisa can do uh, uh, terrific videos on YouTube of uh, your little story of uh, who you are, what you want to do, and what you want your children, grandchildren to be remembered. And some of these stories have been etched in the National Library of Congress through the StoryCorp app. So if any of you guys have any interest, please contact. And uh, I'm going to, on the chat section, I'm going to put it for everybody to, you know, put uh, uh, my email address. And, uh, and then so let me know if, if any of you guys have any interest in, uh, in the stories of yourself. You know, on a, on a YouTube, and uh, and I want to thank you at the end, you know, for making this very successful. And uh, I was just a little bit leery about, you know, so many people from so many parts of the the world and country. How are we gonna smooth it? And uh, I am just so joyful and thankful to be in this generation, enjoying the technical advantage of. Uh, uh, of realizing uh, a Sanskrit word uh, sentence called Vasudeva Kutumbam, this whole planet is a small family. That's what is uh, making it happen. It feels like that way to me. So I thank you guys and thank you each and everybody and uh, to the presenters and the participants and everybody and uh, enjoy yourself. Have a good night's sleep in India. It's uh, 10 o'clock, 10.30 right now, I'm sure. And all over the United States, you know, let's get back to work. And thank you guys you know, for everything that you do and appreciate uh, all you do. And I appreciate today for participating in this uh, uh, pastoral care, fourth annual pastoral care celebrations. And uh, we'll see you again maybe next year. Bye-bye. <laughs>